Um, a little bit about me. My name is Michael Collier. I'm a cloud solution architect with Microsoft. You can find all my contact information here on the screen, so I'm not going to read that to you. Um, you can also download this deck off of my GitHub repo. So if this animation works, it'll be right there. And I think Star Trek is going to have a, such a spot as well, so I'll get it to, to their Git repo after this. If you want to know more about Azure and you're kind of new to the Azure platform, I have a book that came out a year ago or so. It's Relatively Introductory uh, Fundamentals of Azure. Apparently, I mean, people thought this was the home automation section talk because there's a massive crowd now just leaving. But that's cool. You're all missing out on really cool stuff because this is so much cooler. But you can go ahead and get this free ebook. It's about a year ago. It's relatively introductory. I've got a new one coming out um, as soon as I can find some more nights and weekends to work on it. Um, go ahead and down that one, get that coming out. Also, one last bit of promo stuff. Cloud Develop is a conference I help run with several other people in the community. So it's Azure, Amazon, Google, Salesforce, all sorts of just kind of general public, private cloud in general, all up. If cloud is of interest to you, uh, go to clouddevelop.org. Our speakers were notified last night. So as soon as we get around to updating the website, which will hopefully be tonight or tomorrow, um, that'll be all up on the website and ticket sales will go online on Monday. Uh, but check out clouddevelop.org for more info there. All right, enough of the promo stuff. Let's talk about some Azure things. So today, I want to go over just a little bit on Azure Resource Manager, give you the quick five-minute or less view on what Azure Resource Manager is. Then we're going to start diving into the templates, kind of here's some basic constructs that you're going to be, need to be familiar with when working with templates, how the language works, and the expressions that you'll need when building out ARM templates. We'll see a little more advanced template at the end and some questions from there. So before I get started into kind of what Azure Resource Manager is and dive through, I'm just kind of curious, who's used Azure and Azure Resource Manager? Like, how fast do I need to go through this? Or slow do I need to go through this? Fast? Fast. I see, I see thumbs up for fast and no thumbs up for slow. The carbs are just set and people are taking naps. Got it. All right, so we'll do it in five minutes or less, hopefully. So resource manager, from working with things in Azure, Azure really has two control planes. There's a classic control plane, Azure Service Management. You'll see it abbreviated as ASM or sometimes RDFE. This has been around since day zero in Azure. You'll see it in the classic Azure portal, so manage.windowsazure.com. If you go to PowerShell, you'll see you know, something-azure, and then the noun that you wanted to work with. If you're in the command line tools in Azure, it's the ASM mode in there, Azure Service Management. For anything new, you should probably be moving towards or definitely using already Azure Resource Manager or ARM. It is the more modern way to develop is where everything is going in Azure now. All new innovations and new efforts are being put into this control plane. ASM will live around for a while still, but you're probably going to see much more innovation. You will see much more innovation on the ARM side. The new Azure portal, portal.azure.com, portal that's all based on this new control plane within Azure. Any of the PowerShell verbs you work, any of the PowerShell commandlets you work with, are going to say dash Azure RM to them. RM, Resource Manager, if it doesn't say RM, it's a classic one. So the terms you'll, we'll go through today a lot. You'll see much on, whoops, skip to one side, resource. It is the, the unit of work or the unit of deployment you have. So a storage account is a resource, a virtual machine is a resource, and so forth. I can have resource groups. Multiple resources can live in a resource group. Every resource must live in a resource group. I have resource providers. These are individual providers, Microsoft.compute, Microsoft.storage, and so forth, that actually are responsible for managing and working with those individual resources. There's multiple resource providers out there. And then resource types as well. So like I can have Microsoft.networking, uh, maybe slash availability set, or um, subnets, or things like that, different types of resources within a resource provider as well. We'll see all those coming up as well. Why do people, why is this such a big thing in the Azure space? You get desired state deployment with Resource Manager. So it's kind of like a desired state configuration, DSC sort of thing or chef thing, but for managing assets in Azure. Um, it's similar to, in some ways, cloud formation with AWS, if you've gone, gone down that route. Much faster deployments. Resources that aren't dependent on each other in Resource Manager can deploy in parallel, whereas in the other environment, they kind of deployed serially. So I can deploy bigger environments much faster with this. I can apply more granular permissions. So instead of just co-admin or none, I can have readers and writers across different, permission, across different resources in Azure, so much more fine-grained control there. I can orchestrate out how I want things to work. So I can say I want dependencies in place. So I can have maybe a website that is dependent on a database being in place. 
So I can add in that sort of logic as well, which I couldn't do before, at least without, without some custom coding. This dependency chain is built into the platform. And a much more configuration based. So the nice thing about Resource Manager is I have these templates that I can work with. I can take these templates, these JSON formatted documents, I can put them in source control or put them wherever I need to be, and this is my deployment, this is my environment that I'm working with, so I can easily reuse this and parameterize this going forward. Resource Manager, from an API perspective, right? we have our tooling section, so it could be things like Visual Studio, PowerShell, the CLIs. They talk to the Resource Manager API itself, and then there's a provider contract that each individual provider needs to adhere to. So as the Azure platform continues to grow or, the, or individual teams want to update features, like say maybe SQL DB wants to update a feature, they don't have to ship into the entire ASM, uh, the legacy API. They can update just their individual providers in time they want, so it allows the teams at Microsoft to deploy much faster because they're not dependent on one big ship cycle. They can kind of deploy as they need to. As long as they adhere to the contracts, everything works out pretty well. Hopefully that was, does that make sense, resource manager in under five minutes? Clear? This is a vocal group. All right, I got a couple of thumbs up and a, a question. Does resource Right, affinity groups are no longer necessary. They haven't been for a while. Yeah, resource manager, we'll talk about kind of what it manages coming up, but yeah, it's mostly I have this resource, this VM, this web app, they need to be kind of provisioned here and have a certain sort of configuration to them. And then you can deploy your assets to that. Yep. All right, so templates, the basics of how the templates work. The basic thing that I see a lot in working with people with Resource Manager is what is Resource Manager responsible for? When I'm working with Resource Manager, an ARM template is responsible for things outside of the box, right? And then I have things inside the box that other components, like maybe PowerShell, uh, some shell scripts, Chef, Puppet, those sort of things are responsible for. So when I say inside the box, I'm or outside the box, I'm talking about these are things like our virtual network, our network topology, how does the subnets work, what are the IP spaces there, uh, how do I want permissions to work, do I want to apply certain roles to certain types of resources, what do I, how do I access any sort of secrets, do I need to get connection strings or passwords in there, maybe I use a service like Key Vault or something else to go and handle that. So it's outside of the box. Inside the box, once I've stood up that VM or that particular resource, I need to get content into that. So Azure will stand it up with the resource manager, then it's my responsibility to use a shell script, PowerShell DSC, Chef or Puppet, something to actually configure that machine. So if I'm setting up a VM, I want to use PowerShell DSC and the Windows environment to go ahead and do that. Or if I'm running a Linux box, I'm able to use a shell script to go ahead and deploy some assets too in that way. Resource manager does not really care so much about what you're using to handle getting the assets onto that box. It'll go ahead and call out PowerShell DSC or a shell script, and that's about where resource manager's responsibility stops. Right? It doesn't care if that script succeeds or fails or what it really does, it has no knowledge of that. It just did what it was told and invoked that script. Resource manager benefits from, hey, if I can't provision a certain resource, resource manager knows about that and can retry and handle things appropriate from that point on. So what do these templates look like? The basics of a template. The schema and content version you see at the top here, these are pretty much the same. These are the same on every single template. The things that get more interesting are the parameters, variables, and resources. That's the basic structure of an ARM template. The parameters section, these are the, like I'd expect, I can pass in parameters into a template if I wanted to reuse this template over and over again. In this example here, right, I can pass in a username I can pass in information about an operating system version, and I can say it has a default value, so if I don't pass this in, every template will use Windows Server 2012 R2 Data Center, but I will allow people to use one of these versions of, of Windows as well. And I can have some metadata as well, so if your tools want to take advantage of that, they can do so to kind of make a richer experience for people. When I look at the variable section, I can go do things like maybe I want to hard code in, or make some variables like I want to be a Microsoft Windows Server for the image name. Maybe I want my virtual networking to be static as well, so I can kind of put that in place if I don't want to parameterize that. But I can also make them a little more dynamic as well. And we'll see stuff about concat and resource ID coming up. But I can maybe build out a string as well, taking advantage of several of these different properties and functions to make out what I want a storage name or a virtual network or subnet to be called as well. And I can use these variables in the template. Then when it gets into individual resources themselves, 
right? So I have an array of resources, and they have different types associated with them. So Microsoft.Storage is my resource provider, and this a storage account is the type of resource that we're provisioning. I have a name to it, a version of the API. So I mentioned that the different providers can ship multiple versions of an API or of contracts that they have, or excuse me, versions of their providers. So I can add new functions there. It makes it very easy. I can stick to, stick to a certain version. Which Azure location or region is going to be deployed to? Any sort of tags? So I can tag this stuff. It'll show up in a power. Excuse me. It'll show up in a portal or bills if I want to as well. And some properties associated with this. And I can have a whole lot of these resources in this array as well. That's the basic structure of a resource manager template. So I can do. I mentioned how do I get stuff onto that box though. I can use something like. In this example, a DSC extension. So if I want it, that is probably a little hard to read, but I'm trying to fit it all on one side to make it easier. So I have a resource extension of type extensions. And then in red here, right, I have a publisher. This is a PowerShell DSC extension. That's current version of that particular extension. And then for DSC, where do I want to deploy? Maybe I have a URL that is go, goes out to my DSC zip file, and this could be deploying web packages as well, web deploy. Thing to keep in mind with this is any of these URLs, they have to be publicly accessible. Or they have to be accessible on the internet so that the resource manager can go and grab them. So people will put them into a GitHub repo they can get access to. If you want to secure them in some way, you're probably your best option, we'll see an example of this coming up, is put them into like something that, like an Azure Blob storage account and use a very short-lived shared access signature that you set when you do the deployment and pass into your template so you then can keep that short-lived. It's still public, so if someone could guess it, they would still be able to get it, but it is a very short-lived cycle, maybe for like five minutes or something like that, that would be available. Something to be aware of there. How are we doing so far? Too fast, too slow, making sense? Right on? All right. So one of the biggest things with working with templates in the past has been people provision their resources in the Azure portal, and then they want to save them, and we couldn't do that. As of maybe about a month or so ago, they had the ability to export from the Azure portal, so it's finally here. It's kind of like the easy button. I, per, I go ahead and build out all my resources in the portal, and then I can export that particular resource group. If there's maybe a previous deployment that's available and I want to export that deployment, I can go ahead and do that as well, which is really nice. I can also save these templates now, these exported templates, into a template gallery that's available in the portal, and I can share that with someone as well. So if I, want to, if I have a colleague that wants to use a certain template that I've made, I can go ahead and share that and apply permissions to that as well. So it gives me a lot of flexibility now be able to do that. What does that look like from a, a portal perspective? Right, when I go in and pick a, pick a particular resource group, I would get, and then I say export template, I would get a screen that looks like this. It'll generate out the template for me. And I have options in here as well on what I want to do with this template. Now I can download this, or I could go ahead and I can save this template into my template gallery, or I go ahead, I could redeploy this template as well, which launch into the portal. I can also go in here and I can see the next section that I've highlighted, templates, parameters. Well, let me edit and manipulate the different parameters for this template. You see CLI, PowerShell, and .NET. If I click on each of those tabs, it'll give me the code I would need to run this template using Azure CLI, PowerShell, or .NET as well. So it gives me the ability to kind of auto-generate some code, copy, paste, and then use that as well. Very easy to work with. I will say before I move on and I forget, that the export option, while as great and as kind of easy button nice as it, is, as it is, it does not include every single resource in the Azure platform or all assets or resource types within the platform as well. There are certain things that will not deploy or that are not exportable just yet, and that's really because every individual resource provider has to add in the functionality for exporting. So as the teams go ahead and build that out, you'll see it come on more and more um, as well in the future. Virtual machines and web apps do pretty good at it. There are some settings in web apps that don't fully export, and you'll see more and more services light up in the future as well as they roll that out. If the portal is not your thing, that's cool. We can do this from PowerShell as well, export Azure RM resource group, giving it the resource group, the path to save the JSON file, and if you want optional comments or default values, you can save that as well. If you're running from a Linux environment, you can do this with the Azure CLI with Azure Group Export command to pass it in those same sort of variables as well on how you want your JSON template to work. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and talk about template language expressions. These are those building blocks that you should be working with and building out resource manager templates. We've already seen a couple of these already in the parameters and variables. Those are the two you'll use right, in every single template. They're there. 
Concat is a big one, just simply string concatenation. You use that a lot to build out different uh, paths or resource IDs into different resources you're deploying, maybe a connection strings or URLs. It's a common case there. I can see a usage case here where I say I want to do variables. I have an authorization header and I am concatenating here the basics, uh, a basic auth header with base64 encoding. So I got a function here, base64, and I can pass in variables that so then I'll get that variable authorization header back. That's what I can kind of combine these together if I want to make something a little more interesting. Another common one is the copy index. So something that people will do a lot is I want to create n of these. I want to create you know, a four node cluster. I want to create six storage accounts, whatever. Well, instead of copy pasting that same resource block n number of times, you can use copy index to do that. So I pass in as a parameter how many I want, right? So number of instances here. I would say maybe the name in this case is my VM, whatever the index is, so zero to n. And then I have a copy block in here. It has a name. You kind of have to name it like a you know, virtual machine loop or copy logic or whatever you want there. And then say the count matches up to the parameters you pass in. And I can then down here we're just doing a concatenation for creating network cards as well for this virtual machine. And when we're done, we'll have a series of virtual machines, series of network cards, all the same. But then I just had n number of those provisioned out. You'll, do, you'll see that quite a bit in templates. Some other functions you'll use, resource group is common. You'll see that a lot with resource group dot location. So resource group allows you to get information about a particular resource group you're working with. The resource ID points to a particular resource. So I can get the full path to that resource ID and use that because if you want to link or put dependencies in place, that will come out to be pretty popular. Sometimes you'll need to get keys for something like uh, maybe like an Azure storage account. So list keys will be your friend there. I can do basic string manipulation or string functions as well, like unique string, too low, or that sort of stuff. And there's a link here um, to a page on the Azure site where you can get all the different resources and examples on how to use each of those different functions. All right, so let's create our first template, something very basic to start with. So you can do this a number of ways, right? Common approaches. Visual Studio gives you a nice editor. We'll see that. Also, depending on the platform you're running on, Visual Studio Code, really nice options in there as well. Um, we'll start off with Visual Studio Code and then switch over to Visual Studio so you can see kind of both environments on how they work. All right, so let's go ahead and switch over and do a very, very basic template here. Is it back up? There it goes. Are we duplicating it? Duplicate. There it goes. All right, is that showing up good in the back? Can people read that font-wise OK? I see a couple of nods, so we're going ahead and assume yes. OK, so we got a very basic application here, a very basic template. Just as a quick walkthrough, right? Here's our parameters section. So in this case, we're going to create a Azure web app. All right, so we create an app service plan, give that a name. It has to be a certain type, a tier, so free, basic, or standards. We've said that the default value is free, but we'll allow people to pick other ones. What is the sizing associated with this as well? So you know, it could be an F1 to start off with, so free. And then D1, these correspond to shared, basic, and standard tiers. And give it a name. Those are basic input parameters to this template. In this case here, for simplicity, we don't have any variables. But then I go through, right, I'm creating a web app here. So this is a Microsoft.web slash sites. Let's see if I can scroll over just a little bit. We got some tags here as well, a dependency. So even though this one's listed first, it's dependent on Microsoft.web slash web servers slash whatever our app service plan name is, which is right here as well. So knows that you need to go ahead and create this particular app service plan first, and then go ahead and create the app service on top of that. And we got some information here about the SKU, so name, tier, and capacity for this particular app service plan. Clear so far, very basic run through on that. All right. So if I want to add in some additional logic to this one, like say maybe I want to add in another resource group, there's a couple of nice things with Visual Studio Code that I think um, that it has that Visual Studio does not have just yet. So this, right, Visual Studio Code, I've gone ahead and added in the ARM tools for this. And when you do that, you can also get some JSON templates as well. So it makes it very easy to actually spit out whole new resources. So maybe I want to add in something like a Redis cache to this. So I can say ARM. You see, I get some IntelliSense pop up on different resources available. Redis, and tab that through. And it blows out this template here 
But let me say I want to do a Redis cache and fills in all the basic properties for that. So really nice options on that. I can open up the same thing in Visual Studio. Uh, so we will open this up in Visual Studio real quick. Create simple ARM template. Should be this one here. Oh, let's just copy this. Visual Studio will open that one up. So Visual, well, the Visual Studio code works pretty well. It's mostly just a straight up text editor with some IntelliSense and syntax highlighting, which makes it easy to kind of validate as you're typing. One of the nice things that Visual Studio does, though, is it gives you a little more of the kind of stuff you'd expect with Visual Studio. It has a nice collapsible options in here. Let's get rid of this guy. As we can kind of see, here's our, where's our Redis cache that we just added. But I also get this nice JSON outline view here, which gives me a way to kind of visualize this from a kind of a tree perspective. And if I want, you know, maybe I can go in here to the resources section. I get nice options, but maybe I want to add a new resource here. If I want, then I can maybe just create a storage account because it's very basic. Call it ST, uh, my storage account. Go ahead and add that, and it spits out the appropriate code for that as well. So pretty basic on that setup. It also will handle, excuse me, adding in the appropriate very or parameter in here as well for that storage account. So it kind of spits that out too. So we have that in place. Now you want to go ahead and deploy that. So I want to go ahead and deploy it. Pretty easy code I'm walking through to deploy that. Um, so a couple of things, right? We're setting up some variables here. Which Azure region we're going to deploy to, which is our name of our resource group. Give it the paths to our templates. Create that resource group. And then I want to test that. Sometimes I like to test this just to make sure that this template file is valid, that all this different stuff I put in actually is good. I didn't have a syntax error in there. And then we'll go ahead and deploy that. Now you notice in here I have also added the verbose and debug flags to the template or to the test Azure resource group deployment. And I'll run that and you can kind of see what this actually does. So we got our resource group created. What I like about putting the debug and verbose in there is I actually can see this debug output here, but I also get a chance to see the template that gets provisioned. So if I had a bunch of like string concatenation, different functions that were kind of building up a template dynamically, this allows me to see kind of the full version of that template as well as it's getting sent out to the platform to work with. So now that I know that this template is valid, we can go ahead and deploy this template as well. Pretty easy to work. So I'll take, you know, hopefully no more than a couple minutes to do there. So that's a PowerShell way to do that. If you want to do it with the Azure CLI, um, I'm not going to run through it as well, but this is in my notes so you can kind of see. It is basically this command right here. All right, so it is going through. If I want to do the CLI, I would say, go ahead, Azure group deployment, create, what's the resource group, the name of that, pass our template file, the path to the parameters file we're working with, and if that's just all there is on, on the parameters file. And then I'll go ahead and deploy that. So I can deploy these templates, whether I'm running Windows boxes or Linux boxes, doesn't matter, different tools, but very similar syntax across both those. And the nice thing about the CLI, if you haven't used it right, is it runs on any platform equally as well. So it works out really good there. Oh no, we have an error. Oh, my naming is poor for the Redis cache. Okay, that's just because I didn't change anything from the template. All right, so we will go ahead and switch back. Did any questions on that example? Did it make sense? It's a very basic walkthrough of creating an ARM template. It was Jimmy John's, so that must have been good. Right. You will get an error back from the resource manager if you try to do, like if I was to export a template in the portal and through the PowerShell command, let's, it'll give you an error back that says I, that these, I could do, let's maybe take a, a, a web app, for example, right? So I deploy, try to deploy the web app or ex export the web app and it'll spit out the template and then it'll give you a list of errors. Like, hey, I, this could not be exported, this could not be exported, this could not be exported, this. So you can kind of see like 
okay, I gotta go back and add that, but maybe I got 80% of the way there. All right, so one of the most, I think, kind of challenging things for a lot of people after they wrap their head around the structure and just authoring an ARM template is what happens when things kind of go wrong, right? You've got it out there, and now I'm sending out this big template to this thing in the sky, and it's trying to provision resources, and it's just not working. How do I figure out what's going on? Debugging these templates is um, probably one of the things that trips people up the most. Um, so I want to share with you some things on how to actually figure out what's going on um, so you don't get stuck on that. First off, template validation as you're working. You saw Visual Studio Code and Visual Studio both can do that. Um, Adam can also do that as well. Anything that can do some JSON validation, IntelliSense, super helpful. If I'm working with PowerShell, test Azure ARM resource group deployment as we saw, super helpful there just to validate that template. It'll extract all the different functions and make sure it's at least syntactically valid, which can be really good. And um, then Azure group deployment, excuse me, Azure group template validate does the same thing on the Azure CLI. So if you're working on a Linux environment, you have that. You can also go ahead and capture the raw request response. So different Azure RM commandlets, if I'm doing PowerShell, I think sometimes it's very helpful to see the actual request response for these templates. One thing I do a lot of times is I'll set PowerShell um, debug preference to continue. I'll ca start capturing a transcript, execute the commands I want to do, and then say stop that transcript. And now I have a notepad file that looks something like this. I have all, it probably doesn't show up at all on this screen but I have all the request response, header variables, and everything so I can see exactly what was sent to the resource manager and exactly what it sent back. This is helpful because sometimes the PowerShell tools don't actually show you everything that comes back. Um, you might want to see or say that sometimes. This can be a super helpful way to actually do that. Another option that's relatively new is deployment debug log level. This is a parameter that is on the new Azure RM resource group deploy commandlet or resource or in the CLI Azure group deployment to allow you to capture the request or response content or all of it or nothing. So I can say, what do I want to capture? So this is very similar to the command I just showed, right, um, to do something like this. But it works only when you're deploying a particular template. So this is very nice if I just want to capture the request data, capture the response data, that sort of stuff. Of course, the normal warning works that when you're doing any of this of capturing the request response, be aware that if you're sending any sort of secrets like passwords or whatever, you're going to capture that sort of stuff as well. So you need to be careful on how you want to log that data or capture that data if you're sending anything too sensitive. Both of those can be great ways to see what's going on. The Azure portal also will show you some stuff. So we can see here I tried to deploy a virtual machine. Hopefully that is better for you than it is for me. A virtual machine with a, a bad VM size. And when I try to do that, I'll get an error in the portal. I can follow that through and I can see, maybe you can see that target VM size, the value of parameter VM size is invalid. So it'll kind of show you some stuff from the portal. I still think you get a lot better debugging information from using the command line tools. So in this case, like from PowerShell, I can go ahead and say Azure RM log. I can do that how specific I want to get. I can say give me everything, all the logging information for this resource group. I can get that for a particular resource group for a particular time. So if I know when I deploy it, I can scope that down. Or maybe I just want to see what's going on for a particular resource provider as well within a particular timestamp. So I'm, I know I deployed something or something happened there, what's going on. I can go ahead and say get Azure RM log and grab that information as well. Now, if you do detailed output, that'll spit out the big JSON for my output as well. So I can get a whole lot of detail if I want to save that, parse that through, and figure out really what's going on at the API level. If you're running on the CLI, same options apply to CLI as well. Azure group log show or deployment show or operations list will give you much more verbose information about what's going on within the template, within the parameters there. We are flying through this stuff, so that's somewhat good. Am I talking just really fast? Crickets, good. I, I feel this is like shock and awe, right? Like, it's so awesome. Or he's boring as heck. All right, we're going to go with awesome. All right, so advanced templates. I just think I cut out a whole bunch of content to fit because I was so worried about fitting in an hour. So we got, I, got a whole bunch, I got like 75 slides here. I can just keep going on forever. So advanced templates. Let's look at something a little more interesting. So when you're building out a template, how do you want to allow people to edit those templates or build those out? You can certainly go in and say, I want to create a template, and I want people to be able to put anything they want into that template. Maybe I'm building out 
let's say I'm building out a six node uh, database cluster. So I got a bunch of VMs in there, I'm gonna have some storage accounts in there, maybe a load balancer and so forth. I wanna parameterize that so I can reuse that. Do I allow people to put in A, just how many nodes should be in the cluster, and then what size do they be? Do I want to allow people to put, you know, I want an A1. Everything should be an A1, so the smallest size in Azure, or they should all be DS, be, uh, DS14s and using premium storage. I can specify anything I want. Is that a good idea, typically, to let people pick whatever the heck they want? I'm gonna go, I see a couple of nods. I'm not sure if it's like the following, I try to stay awake or no. It could be either one of the two. But it's generally not a good idea, and it's not a good idea because people can do a bunch of stupid things. And the platform will let you do that, which can be bad from a maintenance perspective, right? Because now I have to figure out what, hey, what did you do, right? Now I have to figure out how to support this particular deployment, all the different configurations that you specified, what's going on. There's just so many things I have to figure out. Do these work together? No, you can't use premium storage because of cost, or you should use premium storage because of performance. I want to lock you into certain things on that. Subscription management can be a big deal as well. I can very easily blow out the number of cores that I'm allowed per subscription or the number of resources, per, anything else I'm allowed per subscription. So maybe I want to ensure that I don't do that in my enterprise. I can't automate subscription creation. So that's another thing you want to be aware of as well. And just how dense, how dense is this solution? How am I using my resources that I have? Am I taking advantage of that to the most full extent possible? So how do we get around that? Typical best practice is to use a known configuration. You'll see some examples, and I have links at the end where you can kind of download some of this stuff as well to kind of t-shirt size your solution. So maybe I'm going small, medium, large. Maybe it's a database cluster, right? Small, medium, large, I have smalls or a bunch of A4s, and my larges and my production, I'm using some you know, DS14s on that with premium storage. I know it's gonna be an expensive operation. That's cool, but that's our production environment. Or I'm gonna give away a particular solution if you're in a marketplace for free, so I templatize that, a certain size, a community version of the templates, and then another version for enterprise customers as well, where I add in maybe high availability into the solution. As long as I have these known sizes, it makes it much easier for me then to support that, right? Because I know what that configure, particular configuration is. I know what it costs. I can easily support the performance, high availability, just overall maintenance of that solution. So the way to do that, right? I could have a whole lot of parameters in my template file, right? And all these different logics in there. But one of the things people come to notice with resource manager templates is, A, that's a whole lot of JSON code in a file. Right? And some people like that, some people don't. And then uh, there's actually no like if-else branching logic in Azure Resource Manager as well. So if you want to do any sort of conditional logic, like you know, do I deploy, do you want to jump box, yes or no? You can't really do that if-else logic within the templates. So the way that people get around that, and it makes it much easier to maintain, is through breaking apart these templates, when one has of having one big template, to have a bunch of smaller templates as well. And we'll see an example of that coming up here in a minute. All right, so maybe I have a main template, and it could branch off to call a bunch of different other templates as well, maybe for a particular known configuration, so a small, medium, large. I can have some optional templates, like do I want to deploy a jump box or not? I can't say if else, so I might pass in a parameter and then have the template dynamically construct out to invoke a certain one, yes or no, and I might have an empty template that gets invoked, and that's okay, but that's the only way I have to, I don't have if-else logic, I have to invoke a template. Maybe the template I invoke is just empty and contains no resources, but it got invoked, and resource manager is fine with that. It can invoke zero, all right? I can have custom scripts break all this out. Makes it a little more challenging to kind of wrap your head around all the different options that are there, but easier to maintain going forward, because then I can start adding in different configurations and different templates and editing those without having to worry about jacking up my main template in there as well. When you do something like this, you're probably gonna to wanna to start to figure out how do I maintain sort of some sort of sanity over the different options that I can pass into these templates. And while Resource Manager doesn't have normal language constructs, right, it's not a programming language, it has similar like features in some ways. And one of those is with objects, sort of. Right? It has this idea that I can create this object-like structure, it's loosely typed, but I can pass in these objects that allow me to then pass state between templates, either into or out of a template, and it's also sometimes just nice for basic um, organizational stuff, as organizational constructs as well. So in this particular example, on our t-shirt sizing, 
I have a variable t-shirt size. I'm going to concatenate the word t-shirt size with a parameter called t-shirt size, which will give me something like t-shirt size small, t-shirt size large. And then now I have an object in here, t-shirt size small, that has a VM size, a template, count, storage, and a storage that has a name. So if I want to use these, I can say variables t-shirt size, which could throw me to t-shirt size small, depending on what this parameter here was, dot VM size, which would hit me a standard A1. Does that make sense? This could be one of the harder parts about working with ARM templates when they get to, is following this sort of structure because it's, it really requires you to actually know kind of what you put together. And there's no, it's just a JSON file. There's no tooling really to help you figure this out. So you kind of have to figure out your template and get your braces aligned up nicely. So that's objects. You'll see an example of that. When we get into then nesting these different templates. So I have an Azure Resource Manager template. I've decomposed this guy into multiple different templates. How do I invoke these templates? Well, I use Microsoft.resources slash deployments. This is the resource provider that's responsible for handling deployments. So I got an API version for that. I can do incremental or um, complete is the other one. Right? Incremental, roll through them, complete, drop it all, create it all back up. Template link, the URL or URI to a particular template, and the content version is always 1000. Just like working with uh, DSC configurations, these templates must be publicly accessible which also creates the problem how do you do that, which goes back to a shared access signature and blob storage as well, typically. Or if it's on GitHub, you don't mind people using it any place, that's just be HTTP or HTTPS. That's the big thing, because resource manager is going to go out, try to grab that particular template and deploy it. So you can't have these nested templates running on your local box. All making sense so far? Are we doing good? Loop the so have it invoke like n number of child a template a child template n number of times. Yeah. I would. Um, hmm. Properties mode. I don't know. I think we probably have to handle that maybe a different way. I don't know if I could add a. That's a good question. I don't know if I could add in a copy index there. I think you. I don't know. Maybe. We can try it and. See if it blows up. Invoke that template multiple times. That'd be cool. Any other questions before I walk through that one? Templates calling it. I don't know. I haven't tried that particular one. It isn't really like a it isn't a programming language. It has language like constructs, but it's not a language, which makes it also harder to figure out certain things with it. All right, so let's take a look at, if there's no more questions, let's take a look at a walkthrough of a template here. We still got 20 minutes left, plenty of time. So I'm going to go back to Visual Studio Code and let's open up a new folder here. Nested template. And let's make this a little bigger. That's still readable in the back. I'm going to go with yes since I see no nos. All right, so in this case here, let's, where's our template, Azure Deploy. So this is a very crude example of creating, uh, having one master template that's going to create another kind of, kind of a t-shirt size example as well. All right. So in here, we have some parameters. Which region are we going to deploy to? We're kind of locking this into the eastern US and western US. Username, password, storage account prefix. So I'm going to create multiple storage accounts in this template. So maybe I want to call it, you know, like, Stir track, everything starts with stir track, for example. My t-shirt sizes, the allowed sizes there. 
I got a parameter here for the container shared access signature token. So I want to be able to deploy my child templates to an Azure storage account and put a shared access signature on that particular container to use and some information on our virtual network. Let's see if we can't make this just a little, not quite that far. Oh, now we've done, done, done it. So our variables section. So this is where my base template is deployed. Right? I've got it sitting out at call your star trek slash templates. That's my any place where my shared templates are at. And now I'm building out the URL for that particular shared template. So you'll see we'll start with a template base URL variable, which is here. So after the slash templates, I want shared resources.json and then my container token as well, right? That'll give me the full SAS signature for this template in Azure Blob Storage. So it's only good, right, just for that period of time for that token that's alive. Now I have multiple different t-shirt size variables as well here, so I can specify VM size, disk size, and then VM templates. So if I wanted to invoke t-shirt size small, I have a template or building out, it's our base URL, All right? So again, back to here. So this could be, a small could be maybe a two disk resources.json. So I want this particular configuration to use two disk. Maybe when I get to medium, I want eight disk, 16 disk, whatever. Maybe this is just how many disk and how, many, how big the VM is. And then our token here as well. Uh, into blob storage. So we got one similar one for medium and large. Our t-shirt size, which we saw before in the screenshots, kind of an object here around what I want the operating system to look like. So Windows Server uh, 2012 R2 and the latest version of that. And then some information around network settings. So when I build out some of this, we're going to need different network settings. Which availability set do I want this deployed to? And now we look at the resources. If I'm in here at the resources section, there's only real two resources in the main template. In this case, it's both, the both resources are of this deployment type. So the first one is shared. Why might I want a shared one? Well, it's a shared, yeah, I can reuse this. But in this particular case, I have some assets that are shared, like a virtual network. If I'm deploying a virtual machine, in the resource manager model, a virtual machine must live in a virtual network. So no matter how many VMs I deploy, I'm going to have a shared virtual network that they live in. I'm probably also going to have some storage accounts as well. They're going to be shared across those VMs. So I can put in these kind of a shared resource into a special template, and then individual specific templates can be invoked after that. So the two disk one, the eight disk, the 16 disk, they can all be invoked afterwards, but I'm always going to deploy this shared resources one. In this case here, we're just going to go ahead. Here's our link to our template, and then some parameters that get passed in to that particular template. So if I was to go look at the shared uh, template, shared resources, right, there's our parameters being passed into this template. We have no variables in this case. And here's, whoa, don't hit that button. The individual resources we're going to deploy. Right, a regular Azure storage account, but I know I'm going to need several of these storage accounts to support this infrastructure. So I'm going to create, use the copy index here to create n number of storage accounts that get passed in. There's our copy loop there. You also see here, I'm actually have a new one that I've, I'm kind of fond of, a storage account lock. So what I can do with this, as I'm creating these storage accounts, I can also have another resource that says, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and for the storage accounts that you're creating, and I'm doing this based off the name, I want you to apply a resource lock to it, uh, do not, uh, cannot delete. So I cannot delete this particular resource or resource group unless I explicitly remove the lock. For storage accounts that are backed by VMs, that's kind of important because the VMs need their storage account. So if someone were to try to go, oh, I'm not really sure what the storage account is and try to delete it, your VM goes, comes crashing or they try to delete the storage account, maybe not thinking about what they're doing. Resource manager, if you have the proper permissions, would let you do that. With the lock in place, it'll stop you, and then you go back and says, yes, I want to remove the lock explicitly, and then I will be allowed to delete that particular resource. Right now, I mentioned virtual networks be shared as well. So I have this virtual network here, Microsoft.network virtual networks, passing in our region, our properties. So I can actually go into those properties that we saw on the main template. Those get passed in as an object that I can then start reusing here like my address prefix is from my network settings parameter, subnets, data, prefix. So I can blow this out as big as I want off this kind of loosely typed object. Pass in the availability set. I don't have it in this example, but 
Resource manager templates can also have outputs as well as so I have inputs. And if I was maybe to get an IP address from the virtual network or I was to create a public IP address, I'm going to pass back out. I could get that here and pass that back out to the calling template to reuse later. Where's Azure Deploy? There it is. So that's our shared resources. Now the main one to actually deploy in number of virtual machines, depending on what t-shirt size we have, is very, very similar. Right? I say I'm working with the Microsoft the Resources Deployments. It's depending on this shared template. So I always make sure that shared template is deployed first. And then to go through and, hey, I want to deploy the t-shirt size VM template. So whatever we have specified up here right, for that template, for that VM size, a medium one, or in this case a large one or a small, we'll go ahead and deploy that particular template. Uh, and then parameters that get passed into that, very similar to the shared one. In this case, information about particular operating, excuse me, for a particular virtual machine, like it's uh, admin passwords, machine settings here for the VM size and availability sets as well. So as we go look, I don't have these templates built out for all small, medium, and large, but if we look at the small one, the two disk resources, like you'd expect to see, here's some parameters that get passed in that we saw from the parent template. Some variables that we're constructing here as well about kind of what namespace are we using, regions, admin, usernames, virtual networking, stuff like that. Basically creating a virtual network. And in this case here, I might need multiple network interface cards for multiple virtual machines. In the resource manager model, I create network interface cards explicitly and then add them to virtual machines. So you create X number, a number of those, allocate those as a dynamic IPs and get their information there. Then actually create n number of virtual machines based on our copy parameter here, VM count. You can see that this virtual machine is dependent on the network cards being created as well. And then properties associated with that like um, our storage profile. So what's our operating disk look like? So in this case here we have to build out where is this particular operating system disk. You can see there's quite a bit of string concatenation to say based on the storage accounts I have, where do I want this particular disk to live? as well as the data disk. Where do, they, where do they reside here on this VHDs? Build out our network information here and our diagnostics profiles as well. So I can build out a lot of information, a lot of configuration on a particular um, size of SKU that I want to work with, so small, medium, large, what have you, and so forth. Questions on this so far? It's, a lot to, it's hard to kind of walk through these big templates. I'm going to take silence as got it all. So cool, keep going. All right, so now we have, we've seen the shared resources, we've seen the main Azure Deploy template, we've seen the resources template. Let's look at the deployment script for this. Let's actually just switch over to the PowerShell ISC because we're gonna go ahead and execute this later. And white backgrounds will brightens up the room. All right, so the same things you would expect before that we saw last time. Right? We're going to use our Azure Resource Group location, our storage, our resource group, give it a name. What's the name of our storage account? So these here, excuse me, this lines here, 10 and 11, and 16 through 19 are really related to getting our shared resources. So if our main Azure deploy, right, that could be sitting local, but these individual ones, these nested templates, are actually getting are actually out in blob storage. Now in this case, I've already preloaded them into blob storage. But if I was to create a more robust template, I'd probably have them loaded into blob storage in some way uh, using a PowerShell or AZ copy or some tool like that. But as they are, they're sitting in private containers, which means I can't get access to them. A resource manager can't get access to them. So I need to go ahead and figure out, okay, storage account name, resource group, because I want to go ahead and get a shared asset signature for the container that they live in. So to do that, I need to create a storage context for a particular storage account and then I need to get storage key, so we'll just programmatically go ahead and do that by get Azure RM storage account key. With that key now in a storage context, I can go ahead and get a shared access signature for that particular token, for the particular container. So in this case, the templates container, read-only permission. I'm going to ensure that everybody goes through this using HTTPS only. And we're going to make this valid for two minutes from now, just in case there's a little bit of drift. I want to have a little bit of buffer and good for 15 minutes. It's only good for a relatively short period of time. But that access signature now, go ahead and create our resource group. I'm 
creating a VM. So I'm going to actually go ahead, instead of hard coding the password, we're going to say get credentials. I could probably pull this from a file or something else as well, and whatever you want to do there. Get that credential. Now I can validate this particular template as well. And we'll see the same stuff we saw before. Make sure this template's valid. And then go ahead and deploy this particular template as well. What I've done down here, we're going to, let's see, let's, we need to validate this template. Let's go ahead and validate everything just for fun. Let's run this. Get this guy started. And I think that should be good. Oh, no. Oh, let's see that, what we get here. Did I hit something wrong? Oh, did I bust up something? I'm going to have to come back and see what I broke. So we're logged in. Let's try this again. Huh. Okay, we'll have to come back to that and fix that. Okay. Then once we, if I had not broken this apparently, we'd say new Azure RM resource group deployment. There's our normal parameters here. I can pass in like our shared access signature token in here. Which we then pass into the pram into our template file, right? And go ahead and deploy that. Now, I also showed this option on deployment debug level all. So when I do that, I actually go ahead and can get those deployment operations back out by the git Azure RM resource group deployment operations commandlet, passing in the name of our deployment and our resource group. So in this case here, by default, it'll generally just spit it a bunch out to the screen, which can make it a little bit hard to figure out kind of what's going on. But here we're actually going through and saving this out onto a file so I can kind of see what we've actually deployed in that manner as well. Yeah, any sort of the request response. Yep. Yeah, good question. So where are the templates? So in this particular example, I didn't, up, I didn't upload them. They should be like a, a PowerShell script or something else to get them in place. But they actually are living. So they were already there prior to Right. Okay. Yeah, the template needs a, a to do to, I think I added a to do, like, hey, you got to go and put these in there. But they are out here in this templates folder. Oh, it's really small on that screen. I don't think I can make this guy any bigger. I don't have Zoom in loaded. But yeah, they're already sitting out there in, in blob storage. Yeah, if this didn't, if this had not broken, that I apparently broke somehow before this talk, I get that context here, and then that's going to go into container SAS token here, which then from the templates would get, if we follow that through, yeah, so it gets passed in as a parameter, passed all the way through to be, it'll be on Azure Deploy actually. Oh, uh, the variables for the VM template. So if we do, like say this one here, right, on line 90. So our template base URL, and then there we pass it, we append the token at the end there. I'm really bummed I somehow broke my PowerShell script. That's crazy talk. All right, anywho, I'll fix that and get up on GitHub. Sorry about that. All right, any questions on the nested template and kind of some of the stuff that that particular example does? Other than the fact that why'd you break your script? Five minutes left, oh, hi. <laughs> All right, so good, we're running good, I went through that one. All right, so 
Resources that I think are be very helpful as you build out and kind of work on Azure Resource Manager. Quick start templates are, the documentation for Resource Manager templates is getting better. Um, it was bad before it's getting better. And I still think some of the best way to learn about Resource Manager templates and the things you can do is simply by seeing what other people have done. And Microsoft has a very large community kind of sourced gallery of different templates available out on GitHub. You can go out there. You can, if you have a template, you can contribute that as well. There's from some from the product teams or some from the community on all sorts of different configurations and different uh, operating systems and software and stuff like that out there. Go ahead and take a look at those. Building out templates, no joke, can be kind of hard um, to figure out the schemas in place. Visual Studio and VS Code do a good job or doing a better job of giving you some sort of IntelliSense and validation to go into place. But it is, in my opinion, a little bit difficult to figure out different API versions and then what the proper properties are on the API versions. The best way I've found to do that is honestly just to go and get the schemas for them. The schemas are out on GitHub. So you can go and open up the schema and start ripping through it and figure out kind of what the allowed values are because it, it can be rather frustrating and difficult. There's a really good document um, from the Azure CAT team. If you go out to this URL here, they kind of walk through a, a shorter version of a very long white paper on best practices from the Azure CAT team. Um, the Azure CAT team at Microsoft is a team of, uh, of engineers in the Azure program that are assigned to solve some of the biggest, most technical challenges that Microsoft customers have with Azure. So here are some of these are lessons learned that they've had with deploying very large projects using Resource Manager. Visualization of resource manager templates is one of the biggest, is a pretty big ask as well. You can kind of imagine I get this big JSON file. How do I see what this thing looks like? Or how do I know what my resources are and dependencies between them? It's not easy to, to visualize. There's a community tool, ARM Visualizer, that you can work with. You punch, you give it your path to your templates. You can actually deploy right to Azure from this tool as well. Um, so it's pretty nice, but it gives you a nice view. It doesn't do everything. So if you have a very complicated template, it's not going to pick out everything, but it will show you the basic structures of probably 70% of a lot of the templates out there that you're working with. It gives you a start, right? It's a tool to work with. I put in the URLs here for the Visual Studio Code extensions if you're working with VS Code, which I think is, I used to start off with Visual Studio, now I just go to VS Code because I think it's ARM uh, JSON template snippets are a little bit nicer than what Visual Studio has. And you can get all this stuff on, on my repo on GitHub as well. And with that, I think I have a couple minutes left. So any questions on any of that? Yes, sir. Uh, regarding the API versions, which you mentioned as part of the bug list, yeah. I noticed they seem to do kind of a roll up. They did one in like June of last year, and I think they did one in March 30th of this year. Is there some sort of schedule that they will still ship them all to the same API version level? Like on a template, like go through the different templates that are out there and up convert them? or. Right. Not that I'm aware of on a cadence. They seem to kind of go their own flow. Um, I've seen sometimes if they have a big feature they're trying to get towards, they might update around that, like you know the exporting of a template. Um, typically, it's you know probably every six months. It seems to be the kind of product cycles as they kind of roll through. Roll, they'll probably hit those. So March would have. Probably saw one this spring. We'll probably another one later on in the fall. Those are big rollouts. Anything else? Yes. Have they added policies yet? Um, can you define policies within PA? So the question, yeah, can you define policies? Yes. Yeah, policies um, I think are pretty sweet. For those not familiar with policies, give you the ability to permit or to add it, to codify a lot of rules around what you want people to do. So in, this, in that template you saw I added certain regions you could deploy to. So I can set a policy up at different scopes, so a subscription, resource group, or whatever, on things like what am I, where am I allowed to deploy to, what resources am I allowed to use, is there certain naming conventions that are used, that sort of stuff. And if someone violates that policy, what should happen based off of that? Do I want you know, emails or a webhook notification to go to something that then I can have a richer alerting system built into as well? So it gives you a lot more control to lock down and kind of uh, put restrictions on what people are allowed to do. Within your I can see people, we've had some customers say, I don't want to deploy to um, Asia or Europe. I want all my deployments to be deployed to the US region. So we put a policy in a subscription to allow that to happen. 
All right, with that, I have like about one, I have no minutes left. Um, so if, thank you very, guys very much. Um, appreciate your time, and I'll get all the stuff on GitHub. Thank you.